Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. And as you can see, I'm not at home again. I'm back with James Hudson at DCC Train Automation. And here's the baseboard which we built at the last episode. And if you haven't watched that, there should be a link just up here. So the baseboard is now complete and now we need to build the helix. So what I want to do now is just go through the major components and um, list through some items that I believe are vitally important before you might want to embark on a similar uh, evolution. Now before you embark on this evolution, a little word of warning, and that's the cost. Because the most, in, in the most expensive item on this um, elaborate construction is the track. Now I've used uh, Hornby 4th radius double curve R8262 and Pico's 3rd radius double curve ST-231. I normally use Pico track, I think it's the best, but Pico don't make a double curve and I didn't want to use the, the half curves from them. So that's where I am with the tr track and the bad news is to construct five and a half turns as it were, because there'll always be a half because you go in and come out, that's 44 pieces of track. So you really need to do your homework first before you go and buy these. Um, to get the, the cheapest you can really. I mean, you can go onto eBay and everything else um, or, you know, well-known model railway suppliers, let's say, and try and get a good deal. But it's a lot of track and it's a great deal of money. You could, of course, do it with flexi track, but the reason I'm not using flexi track is this is, from an engineering point of view, perfect. It's the perfect circle. So you're not having to faff around and start chopping things uh, around to get a perfect circle. So that's why I lean towards the third and fourth radius curves. And because of the th th third and fourth radius, of course, your coaches aren't going to collide. So there we go. Right, that's the track. Um, and a little bit of physics. We like a bit of physics, don't we? Um, the up, the outside track is always going to be less steep than the inside track because obviously the outside track is shorter. And therefore, the incline on the outside will be less. So it makes more sense for your trains to go up the outside and then back down the inside. It makes it much easier with a more gentle incline, if that any makes any sense whatsoever. So what makes up the components? Well, with the baseboard, you can either buy it from James or you can build your own. And then from there on, you need certain components that come with a kit. Well, what comes? Well, you get these um, segments and there are eight of these uh, to, to each circuit let's say. There is a base plate which goes between the segments and then there are these two, um, what would you call them, locating pieces um, to hold the segments together. There's threaded rod and I think this is M8 as they call it and then obviously you get tons of that and washers and uh, nuts and it all goes together. So if you were going to build your own um, and you constructed your baseboard, you order the kit, lay it out just as I have here, whoops, and once it's in position then you need to drill the holes from these pieces through into the baseboard and then insert your threaded rod as you start your build. It's worth mentioning what space you need for this. Well, this construction is about 51 inches across. I mean, this is a big piece of kit. So you really need to make sure that you've got the space to accommodate one or two of these, depending on what you intend to do before you embark on, the, on this little journey. The cable I'm going to use throughout this is uh, 1602 red and black. And that's 16 strands of 0.02 millimeter cable, not 702. I don't think um, the, well, the voltage uh, drop could be too much on the 702, so I've gone for 1602. And each circuit, I think I've worked it out that the outer circuits are 3.8 meters long, which is obviously quite substantial. So there'll be two feeds per circuit. So one on one side and one on the other, and then all will wire back. And if you into block detection and that sort of blah, then each circuit will be one block, all wired up into something called a BDL 168 from Digitrax if you into these kind of stuff. Right, um, as I mentioned, the, the outside radius is obviously a bit of maths, isn't it? It's 2 pi r, 
um, to give you your the distance and as, as I said it works out at uh, 3.83 meters or 14 feet which is obviously quite a substantial length and I imagine that most people's trains actually wouldn't be that long so having one block per tier if you're into block detection it would it would <laughs> kind of make kind of sense as I always tend to say for track bed I went into Wix and I bought this packet and at I think it was 26 pounds a packet or 40 pounds for two we then cut them up and glued them onto these segments but fortunately this is the last one and as you can see it's been a bit of a challenge onto this um, this birch ply to stick the um, the underlay all I'm using is neat PVA this is the dial uh, PVA which is the cheap and cheerful stuff from B&Q so nothing special but I'm not watering it down I'm just using it neat and um, I've been doing sort of 20 at a time and then clamping them and then leaving them for a few hours or overnight um, and then coming out and doing some more um, it's not uh, it's not the most interesting task I've ever done at least I normally have the radio on but of course I have to turn the radio off for this bit because otherwise YouTube will detect that there's music going on and you'll get a copyright infringement and your video can't go up which I've done before so this is the last one for now but sadly this is only <laughs> the first helix excuse me a minute and pop that onto there smooth that down pop that onto there so these are the this is the ouch but I just cut myself um, this is the last batch for today and with these wonderful clamps again from uh, being cute da -da. give those a couple of hours and the job's done so that's the first 40 odd so just the other helix to go <laughs> I've done more interesting work to be honest the, the track bed is five millimeter thick um, so you've got to then start to think about the clearances you're going to get between your tiers which then takes us on to the very very sticky subject of the amount of rise in the helix whether you work on percentages um, or a, a ratio so if you had a, a 1 in 50 rise that would be a 2% rise and only you know what the power of your locos are and how much drag your trains can handle to get up an incline so what we can see here is with 3.5 turns rising up 18 inches you end up with a gradient of 3.6 percent on the outer and 4.1 on the inner coming down whereas if I change this to 4.5 it's much better with 2.8 on the outside and 3.2 on the inside but if we go to 5.5 then this becomes much more acceptable because you've now got 2.3% rise on the outside and as we set it to 18 inches at the first turn obviously we're going from 0 to 18 inches and now you can actually measure at each half turn where um, what the height should be at that point in time um, and my thanks must go to Lee Stoddard for this because this is Lee's spreadsheet that he supplied me and I am extremely grateful for his efforts so we're going to look at doing five tiers which should give us just over a two percent rise now at this stage i can't tell you if my locos with say you know a stack of train a stack of coaches can actually get up that so what i'm also going to do is use dcc concept power base and we're going to glue that in over the uh, top of the track bed on the outside track only to give the locomotives more um, 
grip, as it were, to get up the, out of the tracks. The only problem I can see is my HST set because it's only got two driving wheels and um, it's a fair old train. So if that can't get up with the power base installed, then I might need to go and buy another power car to go on the back end. The Pullman set will get up no problems because it has two power cars. But getting the, the rise right for British outline locos is not going to be easy. So in this area, we're, it's going to be a bit of a, not a guessing game, but we'll, we'll, uh, as we build it, we'll check it out and see how it goes. So that's all about the theory, so let's get down into the practice. We've also made some cuts in the baseboard to allow part of the baseboard to come up 6mm to meet uh, the first segment so that the locos get a better smooth run in and run off from the helix itself. So what we'll do now is I'll hand over to James and he'll take you through the assembly of the first couple of segments. Okay, so we're going to now start to put together the um, helix. Uh, Charlie has already put on for me to save me a bit of time the, the foam track bed, which he got, he got over the weekend. So kept him busy, I expect, all weekend. Uh, so we're going to align this, uh, get our threaded rods. I've already wound on a couple of nuts just to make my life easier. We are going to bolt these threaded rods to the baseboard, so in the holes that we've pre-drilled. Um, so I'm going to use one of the alignment um, pieces. I'm going to put a washer. So we've got threaded rod, washer, nut. This nut is for the next layer, so it just saves us having to wind it all the way down. I've done it from the bottom up. Um, so that can go in the hole. We then put another washer and a nut underneath. Like so. Just do it loose to start with, don't over tighten it until we, as you build it up, if you haven't got any movement, it gets, they do get quite tight. So we just want to keep it all loose to start with. The nut underneath the baseboard will lock it to the top one. So if you wind one up and one down, that will lock it tight. Um, but we do that right at the end. So whilst we're building it, we want a bit of play. Just so when we put all the components on, it is easy for us to just manipulate it to suit what we want. So that's the first part done. We now need to move on to the second bit. So we need a couple more threaded rods, some more nuts and bolts. So I'll get those bits and then we glue the baseboard to this plate. When we lock all the nuts up, it holds it all tight. And then we just mirror that as we go round for the whole 360 degrees. Okay, so we're gonna now set, put in the second set of rods. On these rods, we have just put on one nut up to the base of the plate here. This will sit and locate on top of the washer to give us the minimal amount of rise from this offset. This will start the gradient into the helix. So two washers, which just sit over the holes. We can then install that into the baseboard. And then again, more nuts and washers underneath on the threaded rod that's just poking through the baseboard. So they're done up. Again, not over tight, just to hold it. We can tighten it all at the end. Okay, so that's that. And now we can start gluing our first piece in. Bit of wood glue just under there, clamp it, let it set. And then from that position, we'll move on. Here we have some normal PVA wood glue. Uh, we just put a little bit on the plate and then we can put in position our first piece. Now, the center of the thread should be where this, the edge of this meets. So once that's in, we can just leave that to set. I'm just checking everything at the other end. So that, that sets, we go on to the next set let, leave some weight on that or some clamps as we go around with a bit of clamp it and just hold it until the wood glue glows off. Now set in the third set of threaded rods and I've separated it from the baseboard with two nuts. So if we did want to raise the second nut up, we can adjust the height a bit more now. So it gives us that separation. Bit of glue on each piece. I've already done that. And now we'll drop in the next segment. Make sure the alignment is keeping the radius the same. Make sure it's halfway between the threaded rod, clamp, 
and so on. And we just keep going in that state. We've now completed six of the eight segments. Uh, so we're just gonna glue the, the last two pieces in and clamp them and let them set. And then we're gonna work out the incline of this first uh, 360 circle to suit what we want. Get these last couple of sections in. We're just using some blanks to clamp it together. I'll just hold it for 20 minutes whilst the glue sets. 20 to 30 minutes, something like that. And then we we'll come on to the last section. Plenty of clamps, always useful. So that's it, that's the circle done. Now the first circuit is pretty much complete um, in, the, in as much as the track bed. So now all I need to do is obviously get the DCC Concepts um, track base down and two lots of track. Um, the droppers for the, uh, for the block detection people amongst us um, these are the power feeds at that end and the stop marks are over there. So what I'm going to do, rather than, rather than use nails or screws, I'm going to use copy decks because I just know it's a very, very useful commodity and pop some of this down all the way around and then add down the, um, these little DCC Concepts stainless steel bits. So we'll pop those in and then work my way around and when I've done that, I'll get back to you. I thought it'd be easier to do a half circle at a time. And then I'll come back tomorrow and see if this technique has worked. Otherwise we'll figure out a different way of doing it. But the reason I like copy decks is because it's not really that final. You can lift it and uh, adapt it without too much problems really. It normally only takes about sort of half an hour or so to dry but in this case it's getting late now so it's what is it half past four so um, I'll just put some weights down and we'll come back in the morning and uh, check it out. Okay, hopefully we're looking good. Now to add some weight. Well that's the first half circle glued down so I think we'll call it a day. Come back in the morning, take off all these clamps and weights and see if the copy deck has held the track down onto the power base and if the power base is secure onto the foam track bed, if that makes sense. So I'll see you in the morning. Well it's now tomorrow, if that makes any sense, and it's time for a bit of maths. As, as I hope you're aware, 
the idea was to have five and a half turns on the helix to rise up or drop down 18 inches. So I'll just explain the maths behind it. 18 inches is roughly 458 millimetres. Now if you divide that by, for, by 5.5, because there are five turns but there's an extra half turn as you come off, otherwise you'd end up going in the same direction, then you end up with 83 millimetres and that has to be the distance from the rise between each level. Um, and that will give you a, a constant rise all the way up. However, for the first bed, it doesn't work that way because the first bed obviously is less than 83 millimetres off. So you then divide, divide that by um, the amount of rods, which is eight, and you end up at roughly 10 millimetres. So between, for the first layer, from the start, you need to rise 10 millimetres all the way up until you get to the first one. And then from then on, it's 80 millimetres all the way through to the, f to the f five, fifth and a half, to the five and a half uh, circuits, and you end up at 18 inches. <laughs> metric, metric and imperial, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong there? But you end up at 18 inches. So I hope that makes sense. Oh, and that should give you um, a percentage rise of just over 2%, which is just under one in 50. There we are. Right, let's get the weights off from yesterday and have a look to see if the, trucks, the track has stuck down well with the copy decks. Of course, I need to uh, make sure that the thing's level in the first place, so it's always worth running a spirit level just across to make sure it's all good to go. And what a surprise it is. Putting the nuts on isn't exactly as, uh, as exciting as I thought it might be. And there are hundreds. Now sadly it appears we've got an issue because using the copy decks on the inside track, gluing the track to the foam is absolutely fine. But with the DCC Concepts power base in between um, the foam and the track, there is a uh, gluing issue let's say and using the copy decks isn't working it really isn't um, muscling down on the steel the uh, steel is floating both on top of the uh, foam and it's not really gluing it next to the rails um, it really is um, it's just not good really and because this area around here will be up against the wall there's no way that once all the other track beds are in that I'll be able to come and fix this and I don't think the answer is really to throw more copy decks at it. And hopefully you can see there the play where it's coming away from uh, the DCC Concept power base. And DCC Concepts recommend using PVA. And I think both will work fine, but it's just a case that they need more time to cure. Well, I haven't got that time, so we're going to come up with a plan B. So what I thought I would do was run into a, a shop in Yeovil that specialises in screws and um, taking along my little bit of uh, track power base foam and board I've come up with a screw that will actually do the job and this screw will drop between the sleepers and hopefully you can see that it remains below the level of both rails. So therefore, um, KD couplings won't snag as they go across the top. And if I put two of these per track, then the jobs are good. So what I shall do now is have a go on that first bit of track and see if they fit. The screws are a little bit on the specialist side, I believe, and they are these things here and I bought a thousand uh, for just under 20 pounds. But they, they're, they're shaped as if they've got a washer in them, so it, it bridges the two sleepers um, to pull them down, which would be fine. They don't have to be in there that tight, just enough to sort of to grip it really. So um, with heat changes in the room, obviously the track will, will want to shift around and expand and contract. Um, so hopefully that'll do the job.
and as you can tell the uh, screw heads are underneath. We're good. Now before I carry on and extend uh, the next tier above this one it's worth mentioning about the standard of track before you cover it up because this really is the last chance you've got to get to it in an accessible way. So it really has to be absolutely perfect before you put the next layer on. And to that end, this is somewhat easier because it's all brand new third and fourth radius track. If you're using used track, which I have later on, which I'm going to use on the second helix, then obviously you need to get um, you know, any glue, any uh, corrosion, all that stuff cleared away before you even contemplate it, fitting it on the layout. So all I'm going to do with this, as it's all brand new, uh, unused track is just check um, where I've soldered on the droppers to make sure that's perfectly flush and then run a coat of Inox over it um, because that is a preservative as well as a let's say it's, an, it's not an electrical conductive agent but it does enhance the flow of power um, so as I did I did a video and there should be a link round about here to that but it's the only product I can think of of putting down to protect the guts of the helix rather than finding in many months time um, that you've got a, um, a, a, a dirt buildup on, on the helix and you can't really get to it. To that end I'll always always use a CMX uh, tanker with Inox to run around and do the constant cleaning because at the end of the day this is going to be up against the wall and the back area is going to be very inaccessible let's say. So do take that point on that this is the last opportunity you've got to really get to the track without any um, any of the uh, the rest of the uh, assembly impinging on your access. And just as before, slip them in and clamp them down. One thing I have noticed about this job is you need a lot of clamps. Now with my plan of not uh, gluing down the, the tracks and screwing them instead, we still need to hold the power base still. So what I do is I'm now putting a dab of, well sorry, a couple of dabs of copy decks on each of the, um, comp uh, what do you call it, power base components and then leave them for sort of uh, 15 minutes until they go tacky. And then when I put the track on top, the copy decks will hold them in place because obviously they could just slide out from beneath the track. And I think it's five um, components per uh, arc of track. And here on the decking, I've marked out the inside of where the track will be to give me a guide and where to put the power base. And so I give this, uh, well I give the power base a 10 minute head start and 10 minutes later um, put this down and then 10 minutes later again um, I fit the power base onto here. So then it's a simple case of just popping them in place. And keep them reasonably close together. And I've just added some weights just to keep them in place while the glue goes off. It's now a case of drilling, 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 drilling a couple of holes in the power base. So all I do is pick a point at my faithful Makita and then supporting the track bed And then with the drills, uh, the screws that I bought earlier, screw it down. And the screws are just about short enough not to pierce through on the other side. Because the last thing you would want to do is find you putting your hands in to sort of wagon out and then scratching yourself to death on the end of a screw. Now I've pretty much shown you exactly how I've done this or doing this um, 
So I'm not going to record much more because there's, it's, it's just a simple case of repeating what's gone on before. Um, when the helix, when the track comes off the helix at the end, of course, and heads off into your layout, that's not the end of the track, uh, the DCC concepts track base, because once your your load goes off the helix, of course, your train might still have 10 coaches on the helix. So you need to keep the, the track, the power base going for kind of the length of your trains um, after the helix. So it, I'm sure that makes makes sense, but it's not quite obvious um, unless you've unless like me, someone's actually given me that advice. But there we go. We uh, we share, don't we? So that's really going to wrap up this video. And um, I'll uh, I'll the next time we, you join me, we'll probably be taking this from here once it's complete back to my railway room where we'll pop it all together and see what it looks like in situ. So from these surroundings, I'm grateful for James um, to allow me to, to build it here, to get the feel of it and to get his input as I've sort of built it up. Um, so I'd like to thank James from DCC Train Automation here. And most sincerely, I'd like to thank, of course, the patrons. And if you'd like to be one, there's the button or you make a donation. Please don't forget to subscribe. And of course, there should be a video here and here. And I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.